Well, good morning and welcome. Can you hear me? It sure sounds like it. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I stand before you with great joy and trembling because this morning we're going to peer into the very heart of the cross of Jesus Christ, the heart of God, the heart of this gospel, and really the heart of our hope, the, the wondrous cross. The hymn writer said, it has a wonderful attraction to me, so I will cling to the old rugged cross until I exchange it one day for a crown, and then I'll throw that crown back down at the feet of Jesus Christ. So today, we're going into the inner recesses of the understanding of the cross. We've journeyed in Romans through some very deep waters. We saw a picture of humans in Romans 1 through 3, through three who I said they're, they're 10,000 leagues under the sea. They're out of breath. They have no hope. They're in fetters and chains and they're in bondage to the dominion of sin under the wrath of Almighty God for despising His glory. There's no way of escape or hope to get out from under it in and of ourselves. Paul labored hard to make sure that no one will look to themselves or to the law to get themselves out from under this bondage. This is a call to poverty of spirit where I hold out nothing and I look only to the resources of Christ for my salvation. We came to these grand and glorious words then in Romans 3.21, but now, but now is what God has done to rescue us from such a situation, such a dire predicament. God has sent forth His Son to bring salvation. Martin Lloyd-Jones calls these verses the Acropolis of the Bible in verses 21 through 31. Their commentator Cranfield said it's the innermost meaning of the cross. That is where we have slowed our pace considerably then in our study through Romans. No one hurries through the cross of Jesus Christ. This morning we come to what I'm going to call the linchpin of the current section that we're studying here in verse 25. And I want to try to explain that to you if you'll look with me in verse 26. So that God would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So in verses 21 through 24, we have been told that God is a justifier. God is a God who declares the, the guilty not guilty. Job asked, how can a man be right before God? And we looked at his amazing love for a few weeks to realize that we could be justified. We could be declared not guilty. And we saw that there's a double imputation. Our sins were imputed upon Christ, past, present, and future, and there he died in our place for the sins. And the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed to our account so that now God looks at us as if we lived the life that Jesus Christ lived. And the God of the universe can look at us and say, not guilty, come into my presence, accepted, fully loved, declared righteous, come, full acceptance, adoption. Come into the family. And then in verses 25 through 26, on the other side, we see that God now is declaring that he's just. He's a justifier, and there's a God who's just. And I'll tell you now, this is the crux of the whole Bible, the whole gospel right here. How can God be right in declaring sinners righteous? How can he declare people like us righteous? Any judge who did this in the Old Testament, he was thrown out. Proverbs 17, 15, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. They're an abomination if they declare the righteous not guilty. So how can God be right in justifying the wicked? How can he say, not guilty, after three chapters of saying guilty, 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 and now all of a sudden, not guilty? Forgiving sinners and declaring them to be righteous and giving them full access is the most loving thing I have ever heard of. But is it just? Is it right? If someone came in and killed all my wife and, and my, all my wives, all my kids, and my one wife... And they catch him and we go to court and the judge says, you're guilty, but I want to show you love so you're forgiven. 
and I declare that you're not guilty, you can go free. That guy who killed him is going to say, wow, what mercy. I love this judge. You have so much kindness. This is beautiful. But I'm going to be sitting there going, that's not fair. That's not, you're a sham of a judge. Fire this guy. You should never hear a case again in a courtroom. And that's the other side of the argument that we were going to take up. It needs to be asked. And it's just not asked in our day and age because we live in privilege and we just always think we deserve everything. It's just God's job to forgive and to love. But this word reveals that God is holy. Three times more in the Bible is it used than God's love. He's a holy God. This whole book is built on the justice of God. Animals being slain throughout the history of Israel. The question is, is how can God forgive and pardon me freely without violating his character and his very essence? And the answer is your salvation is free, but it was not free to God. Because of these other attributes of God besides mercy, God's remedy to such a problem that no one else has ever come up with in the history of the world. We have groups who says God justifies, but he's not just. We have those who say God is just, but he does not justify. We have a God who's just and he justifies the ungodly by faith. And so let's look at the justification of sinners and the justification of God in this next section. And so we're going to come, come with me this morning to Calvary's Hill, and I want you to stare at God's remedy that does not violate his justice and, 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 um, and, does, and his holiness, yet it fulfills his great love and his mercy and his grace. Only the wisdom of God could have ever come up with this. The place where all of God's attributes climax in glory, to the place that should take our breath away and our hearts for all of eternity, to the cross where justice and love kiss. Let's go before our God and marvel at what we'll look at this morning. Father, I do marvel and I glory in the cross of Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, the glory of God and the hope of man. Lord, we thank you for this cross and I thank you that you're a God who's just and justifies the ungodly. God, that is the hope of every sinner here this morning. And so I thank you for this glorious reality and this glorious truth of who you are. God, may the aroma of Jesus Christ fill this parking lot this morning in every home for those who are watching. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're looking at the eight elements. Our outline in Romans 3, 21 through 31 is the eight elements of the righteousness that God imparts to the believer. Verse 21, it's a righteousness that's been revealed apart from law. Secondly, in verse 22, it's a righteousness that comes by faith and not by the works of the law. Thirdly, it's a righteousness that's necessary for everyone. And where we have slowed down is it's a righteousness that can make us acceptable to God. And that's where we will take up again this morning. By way of introduction, when... William Cowper was an 18th century English poet. And this man had a miserable childhood. His mother died after he was six, ru- rushed off to boarding school, and he had a slight build and sensitive nature, and he was badgered and bullied. He had great depression. Three times he attempted suicide. He was convinced that he was not one of God's elect, nor did he ever have hope of being so. In 1756, 25 years old, he was committed to an asylum. A man by the name of Dr. Cotton introduced him to salvation, and he'd been much troubled over his sin, and he would cry out, my sin, my sin, oh, for some fountain for my cleansing. And one day he recorded this, the happy period which was to shake off my fetters and afford me a clear opening of the free mercy of God in Christ Jesus has now arrived. I flung myself into a chair near the window and seeing a Bible there, I ventured once more to apply it for comfort and for instruction. The first verses I saw were the third chapter of Romans, being justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to manifest His righteousness. Immediately I received strength to believe, and the full beams of the Son of Righteousness shone on me, and I saw the sufficiency of the atonement that He had made, and my pardon in His blood, and the fullness and completeness of His justification. And in a moment I believed and received the gospel. And later he wrote this after his conversion as we sang. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, as vile as he, washed all my sins away. Ever since by faith I saw the stream thy flying, flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And I pray that will be the theme of every heart here until we die. And then we'll just turn it up a little bit more in glory. So I'd like to look at verse 25 with you at the cross of propitiation. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. There's a couple things I want to look at about this verse. And there are four. The first I want to look at is it was purposeful. If you look, it says, whom God displayed publicly. This word's used only in two other places. Romans 1.13, Paul said, I didn't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you. In Ephesians 1.9, as Robert read, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. And so this word is the idea of design or of intention. The propitiation was planned and it was designed before the foundation of the world, the lamb that was slain before the foundation. This plan is the but now, what God has done to bring salvation. It was used in Acts 2.23, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This was a purposeful plan, planned by God. Second, our verse tells us it was public. This was not done in a corner. In verse 21 of Romans 3, he said it's been manifested. <clears throat> this was not to be hidden. This was his express intended purpose. And one thing I want you to take away from this the term propitiation that we're going to look at today was used to describe the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It was a picture of the Old Testament where the high priest would go in one time a year to the Holy of Holies, and I'll describe that in a minute. But he'd enter in with blood from a sacrifice, and he would take the blood and apply it to the mercy seat. And who would God see at that moment? There's God and the high priest and no one else inside there. But when God brought its fulfillment of the mercy seat in Christ... It wasn't in secret. It was displayed publicly. The sacrifice poured out for our sin would be public revelation up on a hill for all to see. The cross is God's pulpit to declare his righteousness to the world and his amazing love and grace. Powers and principalities and princes and paupers and Jews and Gentiles for all. It's a public proclamation of the righteousness of God, declared and proclaimed. So this cross is purposeful, planned by God before the foundation of the world. It was public, and the prime mover I want you to see is that God displayed him publicly. This gift of propitiation is from God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus didn't come into the world to try to change the heart of God toward us. But the heart of God toward us sent His Son into this world to save us. 1 John 4.10, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the plan of God, and He's moving all of history to this place. So he could move all to the place of the new heavens and the new earth that is our hope this morning. I'm a citizenship of another country, another heaven. 
This is God's salvation. This is the but now what God has done to get us out of that place and rescue and save us. And fourthly, where we'll spend our time this morning is it's propitious. The cross is propitious. The Hebrew word meant to cover. To cover. As Christ would cover sin. The fullness of the word meant to placate. To pacify. To appease. It presupposes wrath. And what we saw in Romans 1-3 through when he starts the gospel, I'm not ashamed of it. For the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In Romans 2, he says he's going to pour out wrath. He's holding it back and there'll be a day where he will pour out his wrath upon mankind. There's a wrath. Jesus said the wrath of God is abiding upon you in John 3. So here's the gospel. This wrath has to be removed if God can ever justify us. And the sinner cannot remove it himself. You could go to hell for all of eternity and never quench the fullness of this wrath. So how could God ever forgive anyone? His wrath and justice can't be blown away like a rain cloud. Go away. To be true to his perfect nature, sin has to be punished. God's wrath has to be propitiated. It has to be appeased. It has to be turned away from us. It's rightful and we deserve it. It has to be placated. It has to be pacified. God could not blunt his sword. He can't ignore it. He couldn't just say, my, my mercy is greater than my justice. I trump you, justice. And in steps a substitute named Jesus Christ to propitiate the wrath of God. And so I want you to come with me to Good Friday, the cross. And I came across this thought from a, a friend of mine this week. And he said, this day was recorded by all the gospel writers. <clears throat> Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. And he said, think about the events that we've read time and time again in the gospels of the crucifixion. And all it ever says is, and he was crucified. The focus of the writers does not seem to be on the pain and the drawn-out agony of the crucifixion. But what seems to be the focus? About the sixth hour, about noon, on a hill, Golgotha, the Prince of Glory, hung on a cross and something dramatic happens. Until this point, what, what we've been seeing from gospel writers is a mock trial Thieves mocking him, others jeering him. They're gambling for his garments. They're putting king of the Jews over his cross. And they're just mocking and ridiculing and scorning Jesus Christ. It's just a big joke. But at noon, the atmosphere completely changes. Noon is the brightest time of the day. And we're told that now darkness fills the land for three hours. And the mockery dies down. And as they're overwhelmed with this strange phenomenon, the darkness can be felt. And you see this darkness now, it's overwhelming Jesus. They could get nothing out of him. He was like a lamb silent before his shears. And all of a sudden during this time, they finally get something out of his lips when he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What is, what is this? I want you to remember a night ago on Thursday night, the apostles and Jesus shared the Last Supper and the famous upper room discourse. And they sang a song and they went out and Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane and everything changes. And now we see him, the scriptures say he became distressed and squeezed and uh, afflicted. And he's fervently praying to the Father again and again. And he's wrestling. And he's saying, Father, if, if it's possible, let this cup Pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And, and he's writhing and he's struggling. And we're told to the, to the point where he starts sweating drops of blood with this civil war that's going on within his soul. And we say, what, what could baptize the Son of God into a bloody sweat? Well, at this point, Jesus is looking into the cup of God's wrath against sin. And it's the cup that he must drink on a cross and in his humanity, he's, he's looking into this cup. Because in his deity, he left 
heaven knowing what that cup was to come drink it. But as he's looking at it, none of us will ever know what Jesus saw in that cup because you could go to hell forever and never drink that cup. It will never be satisfied. It will be an eternal wrath. Nobody knows the cup that Jesus looked into. What you and I would have to pay is an eternal wrath. And, and Jesus looked into that cup and what it did to him, it just makes me shrink back. It's what Paul has been painting for us in Romans. The gospel is the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. And that we're storing it up and there's a day of tribulation and wrath coming. God's glory suppressed and rejected in exchange for our own and worshiping creatures rather than the Creator is big. And it has brought the wrath of God upon sinners. And we're so cavalier and have tried to remove any kind of justice or wrath from our thoughts and our country. But this Bible declares a wrath that baptized the Son of God into a sweat. And for those three hours, the Father put that cup up to Jesus' lips and He drank every last drop. As He bore the wrath of God, satisfying His justice. That was the horrible three hours that we read about in the Gospels. And we call it propitiation. The word that means the world to me. He drained every drop of that wrath that I deserve and would have lived under forever where the worm never dies. And I just want you to stop and just say, if it, if it did this to the Son of God, what will happen to you when you stand before it on the last day? I would this day that everyone within the sound of my voice would repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who drained every last drop of God's wrath on a cross. So that for you, Paul says right now, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He, did, he didn't even leave a drop in that cup. Turn it over, nothing. All gone. Doesn't that overwhelm you just a little bit? Doesn't that, isn't that bigger than COVID and governments? God who's been propitiated by His own Son on a cross. That's the grace and the love of God as the just one hung in the place of the unjust. The Father judging our sins upon His own Son. 1 John 2.2, 2, He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. His rightful wrath toward me, appeased, placated, drained. Now we get the grace of God. We're going to see in Romans 5 too. Now you stand in grace instead of wrath. Three chapters, you stand in wrath. Now you just stand in the grace of God because of propitiation. God can spare the sinner because he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us. Propitiation does not detract from the love of God. It exalts it and it glorifies it. Don't take it out. Don't gut propitiation and take away the wrath of God from it. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Let's take a look at this word propitiation. Its form is used only twice in the New Testament. <coughs> it's used here and it's used in one other place in Hebrews 9.5. Hebrews 9.5 says, and above it, Talking about the Ark of the Covenant is where the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, but of these things we cannot speak <coughs> in detail. So in the Septuagint, in the interpretation of the Old Testament translated, so they, they use the word here for propitiation for mercy seat, the mercy seat. And I just want to explain to you what that mercy seat is in case you've never studied it. God gave Moses the law. And he was to build a portable tab tabernacle to house the Ark of the Covenant. And this Ark was to be the focal point this, of, of Israel's worship. And so the construction is you had the outer courts, and then you had the outer chamber, which was the holy place, and then you had the inner chamber, which was the most 
holy place where the ark was and the veil covered it that no one could go in. So the ark was a gold-covered wooden box about a yard long. It contained the stone tablets from Mount Sinai. The cover of the box was called the mercy seat. And on each end of that was a cherubim. The ark was a picture of terrible judgment that produced uh, death, dread, through the disclosure of sin for breaking the covenant. God sees his laws broken, and he must act toward us in judgment. He can't ignore sin. It's got to be punished. And so there's a mercy seat. And one day a year on the Day of Atonement, the Jewish high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for sins, to make propitiation, to mercy seat. And so he offered a sacrifice for his sin and his family in the outer courtyard. And then he would come in, he would sacrifice a second animal, and he would take the blood, and when he entered the Holy of Holies, he would sprinkle the blood as a sacrifice on the mercy seat. And now, (coughs) God does not see the law of Moses that they had broken, but the blood of the innocent victim. He sees punishment has been given out. Propitiation has been made. So the blood never took away sin, but it pointed to the sufficient sacrifice of Christ that we're looking at now who would come and make propitiation. And so when you think of Israel, what all those other nations must have thought with just all this killing and slaying of animals and blood all over the place. It's all a type. The Lamb of God who would come and take away the sins of the world. They would lay hands on the animals and confess their sins to be identified and then cut its throat to show the death. The most innocent one to ever walk this earth, Jesus Christ came and he stood in our stead and he propitiated the wrath of God which should have been ours. Man, it should have been ours. And he hung on that cross and he took it away to remove it from us as far as the east is from the west to never come back. If you'll flip over to Luke chapter 18 with me, and then we'll close out. It's a parable we're pretty familiar with. It's a perfect setting. You got the Pharisee and the publican, (coughs) the the righteous and the self-righteous and the sinner. And I love this parable. If you'll look with me in verse 9. And so Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, the, the religious. And, and what they do, every, everyone who's ever been legalistic, they view others with contempt because no one's as good as me and you look down on other people. And so these two men go up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and he was praying to who, who, this is kind of interesting, every unbeliever, you know who you pray to? Yourself. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers and unjust and adulterers or even a tax collector. It's kind of the way I hear everyone talk about your own country. They're all that way. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Look, I'm a good boy. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, he was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. He's poor in spirit. But he's beating his breast. Same word for they beat Christ over the head. They're they're beating his breast saying, God, be propitious to me, the sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled on that day. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. What a shocking end to a parable. Everyone in the world, everyone there would just say, man, the the tax collector is so unrighteous and unjust. And the other guy, he's the guy. He's religious. He's moral. He does it all. And this whole thing gets flipped on its head. Why? Why was he justified as a guilty sinner? And there's what he said, God, be mercy seated to me. Be propitious to me, a sinner. Shortest prayer in the Bible, only six Greek words. When we become aware of the the true God and see our sin and our own righteousness becomes a filthy rag and you're done boasting, you cry out to God, be mercy seated to me, O God. 
He knew that a holy God looked upon the law that he had broken and he needed the blood of a sacrificial victim. And he's saying, treat me on the basis of the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, which is faith in God's sacrifice. I love this gospel. I am not ashamed of it. It's the power of God for salvation. And the glory of it all right here. That in that day when this was written, you, you would propitiate the gods, the Greek gods, and you would offer a sacrifice to them. If you wanted favor on the sea, you pick the God of the sea or Zeus or whoever, and you, you make your, your offering to, to get that God to be propitious to you. That's what every false religion teaches. It teaches how your works can placate God. Go do this. Get baptized. Keep the Ten Commandments. You just keep giving your list. This is how you placate God's wrath. But this morning, in this passage, God makes propitiation. He provides the sacrifice. He's the subject and the object. He's the propitiator and the propitiation. He gives himself to propitiate his own wrath. Here's my heart, Lord. Take it. It's yours. It's the only response to such a gospel. John Stott said, sin is you substituting yourself for God, which is Romans 1 through 3. Only he deserves to be in charge of your life and to receive glory. Salvation is God substituting himself for you, putting himself where only you deserve to be under the full wrath of God for sin. I want to close with an illustration. <clears throat> Many of you have heard it, but when I, when I find a good illustration, I like to wear it out like a good pair of sneakers. There's a story of some settlers that were heading west. And while they're heading west, they're crossing these great plains. And there appeared in front of the whole wagon train a huge blazing prairie fire. And it's coming from the south. I think I said that wrong. From the west. So it's coming at them. They're going this way. There's this huge fire coming. And, and, it, and it runs north and south 15 miles, this fire. It's a huge prairie fire. The whole field is aflame. And then there's a wind from the west blowing about 30 miles per hour. And so what, right at this point, there's no way of escape. They can't go north. They can't go south. They can't outrun it. They're, they're just sitting here now to be burned up in this prairie fire after all their hopes of the gold rush. The people were certain that they would perish in those flames unless something was done quickly. The wagon master stopped the wagon train and he said, go set a fire on the other side. Come light a fire. And the men went and they, they lit it and it was so dry, north and south, it just explodes and starts moving. And as the winds kept pushing the flames toward them, they pushed the other fire away from them. And as the flames got closer and closer, they, they moved all the people now and the wagons to, to the area that was already burned, that had now smoldered out. And when the walls of the mighty fire came up to this group, they stopped instantly at the area that was already burned. And I declare to you this morning that is Jesus Christ. There's been a place where the wrath of God has already burned behind you on Calvary's tree. Look back at the cross. And when you see the flames of judgment coming upon you, there's a place to flee where the wrath of God has already been poured out and you are safe. The city of refuge. You'll never know a drop of God's wrath. John the Baptist, flee to Christ. You shall be saved from the wrath to come. There's one who drained that wrath and what it did to the Son of God should cause us to be eternally grateful of what it would have done to me if I had to bear under that wrath for all of eternity. May we never quit loving the Lord Jesus Christ. One Puritan said, I would hate my own soul if I found it not loving Christ. Amen?
my plea this morning is that we would all be safe in this propitiation. And, and if you're five years old this morning, welcome. We love you dearly. And if you're 85 and you've spent your whole life in church and morality, my prayer is that no one would ever stand in this furnace one day without propitiation, without what Jesus Christ did for sin, wrath. And so I'm going to teach and plead and pray and counsel and encourage that you might be washed in the blood of the Lamb and treasure Him for the worth and value of who He is. God is appeased and placated. And right now, He's full of love and favor towards you. I can't proclaim enough that there's now peace with God. And so there's not, I I just don't want you living your life thinking you're still under condemnation. And you're sitting here aware of the sins that you battled all week and you're just sitting under condemnation. And you just spend your whole life under condemnation. And I just want you to look again that all of that condemnation was drained on a cross. And there's a way now to walk with God and confess sins and stay in relationship and fellowship with Him. And so I just, I plead, I just, I shepherd too many people who live under condemnation. And I'm just, there's none. Right now, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who have repented and fled to Him in faith. So there's two kinds of people. Those who are going to bear this wrath of God in their own person for all of eternity. I pray none here. And those who Jesus bore it in your place. And now there's no condemnation and that should set you free. That should be bigger than your frustrations with COVID and your government and people. It should trump it. And it should... It's the way it propitiated God's wrath, it should just take away our frustration and fury and anger and lack of love. It just should just drain it the same way. Drain it when you look at the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I pray that that will be our centering, unifying, anchoring place. So I'm, I'm asking you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm actually commanding you. I'm entreating you as if God was doing it this morning. Come to Jesus Christ. Believe. Have this removed. And what this should do for us, it should just put a light step in our journey to glory. How can I be loved by God and my future and what's laid up for me? And then the other application that I want you to walk away with then is the highways and byways. I just... I got to go. My, my, I, Paul said, I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor to all men because I received this free grace. I just, I want to bring everyone possibly with me. My whole focus in life till I quit breathing is that people would find this propitiation for their own hearts, life, and eternity. So I want to give my life to that and that alone. And so one of the things I've missed about gathering together is just kind of hearing testimony and so right before COVID, a, a new family uh, had come to Southside and just in talking with them during this season, I just asked them, I, I love it. I, I told them they got five minutes. So you only got to be warm for five minutes. And I think he timed it. So start coming on up, uh, Christina and, and Dwayne. I just want you to hear of when these circumstances hit, Christian life is not to be taken up in circumstances. It's to be steadfast in the midst of a world falling apart. And we keep going and taking it up. And gospel opportunities are abounding right now like never before. And so when they shared some of the things that God had put on their heart, they come to give glory to God and nothing of themselves. But I asked them to come to stir our heart toward love and good deeds. So he's going to make my application for me today. My brother. Hi, how are you guys? 
So we just want to try and encourage you as the body here at Southside and just share some things that God's been doing in our life. We start our morning every day with putting on the armor of God, reading our Bible, and just praying throughout the day. As it talks about in Hebrews, about stirring up love and good works, we believe that's how the Spirit starts prompting us throughout our day just to be living for God. So as the pandemic hit and we went into our quarantine, from the time that it started till the time that it ended, God started having us, as it says, uh, go and make disciples. So as we started just doing life, we were, we were going to the grocery store, to Lowe's, King Supers, Walmart, wherever. And as we did that, uh, we were able to share these little Bibles from the Gideons. We shared 450 in that time frame from the beginning to the end of the quarantine when it stopped and started. So that was a huge blessing that we got to share. And then it was funny how God does things. On my birthday, as we're driving back, I'm sitting in the passenger seat in the car. And as I'm sitting there, I'm able to uh, see this guy pulls up next to us. And I just ask him, would you like to have a Bible? And he says, sure. So I take a Bible, chuck it through my window into his window into the car. And then he hands it to the passenger in the seat next to him. And I'm just thinking, isn't that just amazing? Not only does God do it, but God does it on my birthday so that I would never forget what he did. So that was one story. And then just thinking to talk with some other believers about, you know, going downtown to like the 16th Street Mall and just witnessing, bringing Bibles, bringing tracts, just asking God to open up opportunities for us to share how awesome that would be. And uh, some other believers said, yeah, that would be great. Let's do that. We just wanted to say, like, as believers, as we take one step of faith and obedience at a time, the Lord's faithful to give us ideas um, that are first and foremost going to honor him, but also point others to him and show others love. And uh, we just first need to have that heart that cries out, here I am, Lord, send me, as we see in Isaiah 6, 8. Um, recently, some of the ways that he's led us to do this is by keeping a basket of Bibles by our front door so that anytime we have visitors or deliveries, we're ready to go. So recently, there were some construction workers who were working in our cul-de-sac, and Dwayne was able to run out there, grab the Bibles out of the basket, and go give them to him. And five of those workers who were right there said yes and accepted those Bibles. Another way is we make these little homeless bags, and we keep them in our car. There's pop-top food, Bibles, hygiene products, water bottles, super easy to make. But at that way, anytime we see somebody on the side of the road, we never have to turn our eyes away. We can always be in communication or talk to them and let them know Jesus loves you and try to first meet that physical and then meet the spiritual. Um, another way is we always try to say that we're, we never, <laughs> we never like not go on vacation. Even when we're on vacation, we're always ready and trying to be willing and available for what the Lord might have us do. So recently when we went on vacation to Texas and Kentucky, the Lord opened up the opportunity for us to give out 78 Bibles just in that week and a half span. And that's 78 souls of people that either could potentially come to know the Lord and get saved one day, or even just rekindle a fire in their heart if they already had been saved maybe they had been walking away. If we pray for the Lord to open up opportunities, he, the Lord's going to open up those doors. He's going to make a way. We just first need to have that heart that's willing, but then also prepared. Um, for example, as we were leaving church just last Sunday, we were driving around and, and around the corner there's a bus stop and there was a man sitting on the lawn on the grass and Dwayne and I both just had a check in our spirit and we both just kind of looked at each other so we ended up looping around and sure enough when we asked him if he'd like a Bible, he said yes and just to sweeten the deal we threw in some M&Ms too. <laughs> Uh, and James 2.14 says, what good is it, brothers, um, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? And then the last thing we like to encourage you with is there's nothing that you can say when it comes to asking God to open up a door that he's not going to open. The question is, do you want the door open? Do you have that heart to go out and say, you know, I don't care if I'm at the grocery store. I don't care if I'm at the gas pump, Lord. Open up opportunities for me to share your word, to encourage someone, to point someone to Jesus, and he'll do it. He does it every time. So I think one of the last things I'd like to say is, as we desire to walk by your sides uh, here at Southside and be part of the family, we just want to go to Jesus and be with others that want to go to Jesus and point people to Jesus. And one last thing we want to share is, uh, God put in our heart, with all this stuff that's going on, when the people that are being attacked the most are police officers. So he gave us this idea. How about thanking them? So this is a courageous movie. And then I got this gift card for Chick-fil-A. 
in this Bible right here. So what we do is we've got, gone up already to five different police officers and just wanted to thank them for their service and what they do for them and to just let them know they're appreciated. Already five our officers within three days from the time we started doing this. So as Ken mentioned the fire, what if we started a fire as the body of Christ in our city, in our state? What if we started a fire and started burning for Jesus and started pointing people to Jesus? Those who have turned away, point them back to Jesus. What could we do for Jesus and for the kingdom? And how can we ignite one another to say, you know what? We can be a difference. One person one step of faith at a time, we can make a difference for Jesus. So we just want to encourage you with that today and just uh, say, let's do it together. Let's walk by each other's side. Oh, that's good. Just leave the Chick-fil-A card. I'll take it. <laughs> All right, guys, that's, I just wanted you to hear what, what it does in a heart when we get overwhelmed by the cross of Christ and we all are going to look different, but we're all going to treasure this gospel and want other people to hear it and know it. So let's lock shields about the only thing that matters and give our lives to lift high the cross of Jesus Christ. So let's go to God in prayer and then we'll worship some more. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you that you're a just God and the justifier of the one who has faith because you propitiated wrath on your son and you, you poured out every last drop and he was a willing sacrifice and he was buried and you raised him to declare that it was sufficient and we could be saved now in Jesus Christ alone to all who call upon this name shall be saved. God, we thank you for the beauties and the glories of Jesus Christ. Let every heart in here burn for Christ Jesus and his name. I thank you and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.